All right, welcome all. Uh, I have here Owen Palmer, Elena Constant, and Derek Gordon, and their project is Design and Implementation of a Plant Propagation Structure at Vine and Fig. All right, thanks Scott for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we were thankful to be advised by Dr. Wayne Teal and Dr. Jennifer Kaufman. Um, today we're gonna talk to you about um, our work over at Vine and Fig. So Vine and Fig was our project partner. They're a nonprofit that operates downtown. Um, they're an urban food producer, and our goal was kind of focused in on that to improve their overall agricultural productivity. Um, the means in which we were going to do that was to design and implement a greenhouse growing structure with a specific emphasis on plant propagation. Um, and the purpose of doing that was to increase edible landscaping throughout the neighborhood. So Vine and Fig is located in Harrisburg, Virginia, and they're a program of new community project which is a 501c3 organization that's based in Arizona, but also operates out of Harrisonburg and Starksboro, um, Vermont. <clears throat> Their mission statement is to seek um, to cultivate and celebrate works of mercy, social justice, and ecological sustainability as a foundation for a nonviolent life. And as Owen said, their objective here in Harrisonburg is to increase urban food production. So by helping them <clears throat> have a space to propagate plants, they'll be able to um, implement a edible forest garden here in Harrisonburg and they are dedicated to food justice because they're exercising their right to grow, sell, and eat healthy food and healthy food can be defined as fresh, nutri nu fresh nutritious, affordable, locally grown, and culturally appropriate. So this is the uh, the White House which is considered the main house at Vine and Fig. Um, it's at 715 North Main. Uh, just for some reference for some of you that are local, um, Notice the compass rose in the top right, uh, north, true north is going to the right. So Little Grill is to the southwest and uh, Brothers Craft is to the northeast. So kind of sandwiched between those two well-known destinations. Um, the red perimeter kind of designates the property line. Uh, it's just under half an acre of land um, and its zone is M1, which is general industrial. And the house where we actually did um, our construction, the downstream house is zone is R2, which is medium density residential. Um, and now I'm going to take a pause to kind of talk about food deserts and explain what they are. Um, a food desert is uh, defined as a geographic area where residents' access to affordable, healthy food, especially fresh fruits and vegetables, um, is restricted or non-existent due to the absence of grocery stores within convenient traveling distance. And when the mode of transportation is walking, that distance is typically one mile. Um, and these graphics seen on the screen are from the Virginia Cooperative Extension, which is a partnership um, of Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. You can see Vine Fig, it's kind of harder to see, but if you know downtown in Harrisonburg, uh, Vine Fig is right in that zone two on the northern line there. Um, so they are in a food desert area. Um, from the table below, you can see it's a low per capita income area and also kind of right on the cusp there of being within a half mile of the grocery store. Um, one caveat is the Friendly City Co-op, which is 0.7 mile walk away. So that's an option, but some of the products there are quite expensive. So for some lower income individuals, uh, it can be cost prohibitive. So now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Vine and Fig's food production. Um, uh, we, were, we only gained access to their 2015 records, but on those records, they, they, have, they recorded producing over 1,800 pounds of food, um, and that's on half an acre of land. But so even though we do not have the records for 2016, 2017, 2018, um, we believe that this is only increased due to their increased amount of mature trees, additional space, and livestock. So, as Owen said, the White House is the main house at Vine and Fig, but Vine and Fig is considered to be a community of different houses, so um, <clears throat> the food expansion has expanded to other houses known as the Rock River House, the Sun House, and the Downstream House, which is where our project site is located, and that's at 759 Madison Street. Um, so this is just a picture. This is um, the city plot that we have, and then this is a Google Earth image. Uh, as you can see, Vine and Fig is <coughs> the main house, the White House is here, Downstream House is here, but this whole area is considered to be Vine and Fig. So some stakeholders in this project include the um, new community project who actually oversee Vine and Fig as a whole. Um, Tom Benevento, who is the sustainable living coordinator and and was instrumental in helping get our project off the ground. Um, Cornelius Ferenc, who is the garden manager at Lion Fig and is looking is very much looking forward to our structure as 
he will have more space to propagate. And Nicholas Melos, as we built up on his property, and JMU stakeholders include our advisors, Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Teal, um, and just the school as a whole as they are funding our project, and the student team as we were looking to learn, gain some new skills out of this project. So this next sequence of slides is kind of to illuminate some of the back and forth nature of uh, selecting our specific project. Um, and this kind of circles back to this uh, ISAF framework. And I mean, it's a pretty thorough document, but some of the things you can take away from it is um, kind of engaging respectfully with your stakeholders and being flexible when things don't go exactly to plan. Um, and then also kind of the interaction between systems, like JMU is a system and Biofig is a system. You have to recognize kind of the interconnections there and how they're dynamic in their own regard. Um, so the first, we, this project came to our doorstep really um, from Tom Benevento, one of the stakeholders we mentioned previously, and that was kind of via our advisors. So he, his first idea was kind of this edible forest garden, um, but it was more of a community surveying and qualitative data gathering type project, and that was, didn't really fit our time frame exactly, so we were trying to shift more towards something hands-on at Vine Fig that could help their food production specifically. So our team came across this grow sphere, which as you can see is very attractive and innovative, compact, eye-catching outdoor growing space. And the vision that we had was to put this in the front yard of the White House and grow a variety of different food and herbs um, <clears throat> that people walking by could see. Um, however, we didn't realize that there was already pre-existing permaculture design in the front yard of the White House. Uh, what we thought was an abandoned wall is actually used for refrigeration. So <clears throat> Tom suggested building a plant propagation structure over at the Salvation Army site. So right here is um, pic right here pictured is the Salvation Army site where we hoped to originally build our structure. As you can see in the picture, it was nice flat land. We're on the south side the building with ideal sunlight. However, um, the negotiations to acquire this site um, would take too long and would not fit the time frame of our project. So we had to move the project to the downstream house. So originally we had to design a structure that would attach to the northeast side of the house. <clears throat> and the idea was to use the house as a heat sink and to dig underground for thermal insulation and collect rainwater from the roof of the house and our structure. Um, and then the overall objective was to just use less materials overall. Um, however, the house was not structurally sound enough for a variety of different reasons to support a structure attached to it. So we decided to build a freestanding structure that would be more sturdy since it's a very high traffic area and there are a lot of kids in the, in the neighborhood and we need to make sure that it was safe. So, so right here is just kind of, this is, the, this is the first real sketch of the freestanding structure that we created. Um, just as you can see, it's, a, it's against the house. It's, um, we will show you comparison shots later on, just comparing the final product to this. So now once we've talked about um, kind of where the site is and how we're building the structure, or how we thought we were going to build the structure, we're going to talk about now what we would be doing in the structure, why it's important, um, and why we're doing it, really. But that is set, uh, central on plant propagation. So plant propagation is creating new plants from existing plants without using seeds, kind of regenerating plants asexually. Um, Biofig is specifically focused on propagating fruit trees. Um, that kind of ties into that idea of incre uh, increasing edible landscaping throughout the neighborhood. Um, and they do so in a way that's very engaging with the community. They're propagating these fruit trees and either giving them away or selling them um, in the efforts of kind of getting everyone in the uh, community and neighborhood involved. Um, and then that kind of tackles that issue we've been talking about with food deserts, with um, tackling food scarcity and making sure that food that's available is of high quality. Um, and this was all in the hopes that they could be used as like a model for other urban food producers so they could learn from their lessons and also be more productive. So another important point to bring up is carbon sequestration, um, and specifically the book Drawdown, which proposes 100 different solutions to reverse uh, climate change by removing carbon from the atmosphere. And these are two examples of the solutions that Vine and Fig is implementing on their property. The first one being a forestation, which is strategically planting trees and other perennial biomass. <clears throat> and then this will enhance and sustain the health of the soil by returning um, 
fiber store and the carbon content, which improves productivity overall. And currently at Vine and Fig, uh, they're aiming to plant nitrogen fixing um, plants <coughs> around the, the forest garden trees in order to improve soil health by building soil organic matter and um, more, and adding more carbon into the soil as well. So the other um, solution from Draw Down that Brian Fig uh, is implementing is <coughs> regenerative agriculture, which uh, involves no-till, uh, diverse cover, cover crops, in-farm fertility, no synthetic pesticides or fertilizers, and crop rotation. And by gardening, Vine and Fig is not only rejuvenating the soil, but they're also rejuvenating the community in a sense because they've noticed more and more families are moving to this area, which is good. So the location of our project site is the downstream house and the plot right here is highlighted in blue and where we end up building our structure on the northeast side is highlighted in orange right here. So once the site was kind of selected, the next thing to do is to go out there and physically survey it. Um, and this kind of represents our move from iteration four to five, where we moved from a structure that would affix to the sidewall, or, or two, rather, um, a freestanding structure. Um, as you can see, there were some limitations structurally that pushed us in this direction. And there's also, you can see on this first picture here, those line of trees, which are black locust trees, and that kind of uh, symbolizes the property line. So it's important for us to stay five feet away from that property line so as not to encroach on the, property, uh, the neighboring land. Um, so that kind of limited us to a narrow uh, and but long structure to maximize our productivity in that space. Um, so after we had surveyed, the next thing is to prep for foundation. So that entails excavating. Um, we excavated a little bit over what we thought the foundation would be just to make sure there was enough room. Um, yeah, that was the simplest but most grueling part of the, <laughs> the uh, construction. So as we were ex ex as we were excavating, <clears throat> even though we were cleared for digging based on the electric, gas, telecom, and city utility surveys done, uh, we discovered a sewer pipe that was roughly six feet or six inches below the topsoil. <clears throat> so after further investigation surrounding the pipe, uh, <clears throat> we found that the pipe was active. However, it wouldn't be an issue to our building if we were to surround the pipe in gravel. So as we were further excavating the pipe, uh, we just we discovered there were holes in the pipe so it needed to be repaired. But luckily, um, Dr. Linder knew how to fix a pipe. So uh, it only delayed our construction by three hours. But, but without his help, it would have been delayed even longer than that. So, so once that pipe was fixed, um, we ordered our two and a half cubic yards of gravel and and began laying down what would be the beginnings of the foundation of the structure. Yep. So yeah, we'll bear the gravel from where it was delivered to where we had excavated, um, compact it with a hand tamp, and, and then once it was compacted and level, we started to introduce these cinder blocks. The cinder blocks are to act as a footing, kind of disperse the weight of the structure onto the foundation. Um, and the placement of the cinder blocks was an, uh, wasn't too bad, but we uh, would draw lines to make sure they're straight um, and just some basic masonry skills with a torpedo level to make sure they were level in both directions. And then once that was done, we um, filled them with gravel to make sure they were more secure and where they were placed. So for the framing of the house, um, we utilized uh, pressure treated plates along the whole base of the structure in order to um, make sure that, that, was, uh, that the base was rot resistant. And for, and for three of the four walls, we used two by four pine wood from Monger's, a local lumber company here in Harrisonburg. And for, for the, for the um, back wall, the one facing the house, we used exterior plyboard. As for the rest of the walls, we wanted to put up polycarbonate, so that way, for, so that way light could pen penetrate the structure. Um, but since that wall is facing the house, it was less expensive for us to use exterior plywood and just more cost effective to do it that way. So as Derek said, the remaining walls and roof were um, coated in polycarbonate panels. And we chose polycarbonate because it's strong, long-lasting, relatively easy to install. Um, it offers good light diffusion and good heat retention, and it has an 80% light transmitted rate. So this was kind of our final step in construction. It was the front wall with the door. 
Um, the door, we were trying to make the best use of the materials we had ordered, so the door was just made from excess plywood, external plywood, um, and then two by fours that we had left over. Uh, the handle was actually donated, or was taken off a donated door, um, so that was nice. And then the lock is just a very simple rotating piece of off-cut off -cut wood. <coughs> and then on the, you can see on the right side of the door there, there's just some additional external plywood for uh, further weatherproofing. And this is the finished structure with us inside of it. And as <laughs> someone who has been inside of it, we can confirm that it's warm and humid, and it will do its job. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so like I said before, um, we're going to show you nice little comparison shots between the initial design and the final design. Um, there were some slight, slight changes from the initial design to the final, such as we want to make it longer and narrower, as I was saying earlier, um, because we wanted to stay away from that property line and just kind of keep that five foot distance. So we made it slightly longer, and and we also had um, a slight <coughs> overhang on the roof just to kind of, you know. Just for, just to help with um, weather resistance. So overall, our the cost of our of implementing this plant propagation structure was roughly a thousand dollars. However, we were fortunate to be fortunate enough to be provided with tools and equipment, and we had free labor since we built it. Um, <coughs> so in, com when compared to other <coughs> masses of a similar size, the lower end ones are roughly. $1,200 where the higher end ones could be upwards of $5,000. However, these prices don't include um, foundation or cost of labor for assembly. So now we're going to kind of transition, transition into some of the cost benefit analysis we did. Um, and this was primarily focused on the context of economic versus environmental and why we chose the materials we did. Um, polycarbonate is kind of the most important point uh, here because it's probably the most damaging environmentally and it was one of the m most uh, dominant costs in our budget. Um, as you can see, it's non-biodegradable and it's a number seven plastic, so it's quite difficult to recycle. Um, but when Elena was talking about why we installed it, she went over a lot of the points why we used it. Uh, it's very durable, long-lasting, and uh, good for propagating plants and other sort of greenhousing uses. Uh, the primes. Pine spruce wood is biodegradable, um, that's the untreated wood, and then you can see below that there's some more treated or engineered woods. Uh, the pressure treated wood, I mean, that has some environmental concerns. So typically salt nowadays, pressurized salt, but still not great. Um, and then the external plywood has a bonding agent and some other chemical additives. The coarse aggregate and cinder blocks are natural materials, so there's not too much of a concern there and fairly cheap when sourced locally. Um, the silicone caulk is synthetic and it's produced using petroleum products. So, and it's also, uh, the recyclability is quite limited, so some environmental things to consider there. Um, another thing to mention is we didn't really have the resources or the time to do a, like a in-depth, thorough life cycle analysis, so there's some, uh, there's some research that could be done into the embodied energy of these materials, as in the energy needed to produce and then transport these materials, so that's definitely an opportunity for further research. So now we're gonna talk about the different social and health benefits of building the structure. So the structure itself is going to serve as a central hub for plant propagation and the edible forest garden project that Vine and Fig is doing. And the purpose of the structure is that <coughs> it's going to be able to propagate the more difficult plants since it has a more stable environment as opposed to propagating something outside or in a greenhouse. Um, and it will also be multi-purpose as it can focus on propagating the difficult plants, but it could also be used for seed germination. Um, <clears throat> and while we were in the structure and talking to Cornelius, uh, we estimated that roughly 5,000 plants could fit in there at a single time. And the propagation process can take between two and five months, depending on the season. So there's roughly three turnovers, which means that in a year, Oh, uh, in a minimum of 15,000 plants could be produced from our structure, which is amazing. And it's very beneficial to the community because more plants means that Fine and Fig can sell them at lower prices and if they can be sold at lower prices, then more people in the community will want to implement them in their own backyard. And gardening also promotes a bunch of different things such as have an active, healthy life cycle, um, community involvement and it's beneficial to mental health. So. 
So now that Biofig has this nice, shiny, new plant propagation structure, um, what, are, what are they going to do with it? Well, they're going to add garden trays and fruit tree cuttings and, well, continue to propagate them. They're going to propagate those. And, um, and, and uh, as for the Salvation Army site that we mentioned earlier, should they acquire that, the structure we built is not necessarily a mobile structure, but since it rests on cinder blocks, they are able to move it should they, should they desire to and should they want to. So, Jamie can also further be involved in the plant propagation enclosure that we've built. Um, future capstones can do a number of different things, such as uh, analyze the yields and establish a plant propagation baseline. He could also draft a plan to increase overall pro productivity on the binding and fig site, whether it be in our structure itself or just for the community in general. Uh, they could also design methods to evaluate and monitor food based on yield, weight, and calories. And then they could also implement an automatic misting irrigation system into our structure. So now to kind of wrap things up, uh, yes, we created the plant propagation structure, but also, and more importantly, we successfully engaged with our stakeholders. Um, and I, I think we all believe that that was a mutually beneficial relationship where we took away a lot of knowledge and skills and experience and they were they got to receive a new uh, structure that they could increase their productivity with plant propagation. Um, some of the specific things we learned were definitely technical skills and more uh, specifically construction skills. Um, I don't think any of us really had any major construction experience going into this project and we have a little bit coming out. Um, and then also kind of estimating sourcing and dealing with vendors as far as materials go. Um, also problem solving, I mean, it's. There's a big difference between, and that's my next point, I'm leading into it already. Uh, there's a big difference between designing something in a room and then implementing it in the field. So that definitely entails some on-the-spot problem solving. And that's kind of just a means to keep the project moving even when hurdles arise and you have to be agile to overcome them. Um, I'm also speaking for all of us here, but I think we can all agree that the, oh, actually, I'm not going to say that yet. <laughs> um, now we, I mean, what I was just talking about with the, room design, field implementation, this kind of is integral to this ISAP framework and problem-centric habits, problem habits of mind, which is kind of huge in the backbone of this uh, ISAP curriculum. And some of those important things, I mean, like I said, it's, there's a whole bunch to consider, but some of the things specific to this project are um, kind of analyzing the problem and developing solutions specific to the system that you're in. Um, and then also being mindful of how your system interacts with the other systems. So Vine Fig was kind of the central system, and then JMU, and there's, and then just Harrisonburg as a whole is a different system entirely. So just being mindful of those interactions and making sure they work together. Um, also thinking long term when you're creating a solution, not just a quick band aid, but some sort of solution that's durable and that makes sense in the long term. And then also knowing when to seek out uh, outside expertise. Dr. Linder is a prime example, and he was invaluable, really, for this project. Um, and kind of, I've alluded to this a lot already, but just knowing that your stakeholders are probably going to be diverse, and just being respect, uh, respectful and trying to balance different stakeholders' needs and expectations and such. And then lastly, but not leastly, if that's a word, <laughs> being self-reflective, kind of retroactively looking back, or retrospectively, I should say, looking back at what you've created and what you've done. and. Uh, just being sure that it's a responsible solution and something that should have been done, and if not, how can you improve for people to learn in the future? So now I'm gonna talk about our thoughts and feelings about the experience. Um, definitely a little bit stressful, I think. Everyone yeah. yes. agree to that, yes. but absolutely worthwhile. Uh, really a great experience for just doing research and getting out in the field. Um, yeah, just very rewarding, totally worth the ride, and we're thankful for anyone who's made it happen. And speaking of the people that we want to thank who made it happen, we want to thank our advisors, Dr. Teal and Dr. Kaufman, for their consistent guidance and support throughout throughout the project. We want to thank Dr. Fletcher Linder for his expertise and tools. And without him, I don't the the, the construction would have taken much longer. <laughs> uh, and we want to thank Tom Cornelius and the Vine Fit community as a whole, as they. As they provide, as they provide their insight, collaboration, and equipment, without them, the project wouldn't even exist. And we want to thank Nick Melos for allowing us to use his property. 
And I would like to thank my parents, Monica and Mike Gordon, for coming out and helping out with the early stages of the construction. I love you, Mom and Dad. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here's some citations relevant to our presentation, and then we're going to open up for questions concerning the comments. Um, when you said room versus field and how that was like different with like what you're doing on the computer and in real life, how did you guys decide to do, I noticed in the model you had a slanted roof, how, why did you choose not to do that in the real? That's a good question. Very it's a little question. misleading. Uh, the room design, the SketchUp, the model did have a slanted roof, but yes. in our um, implementation in the field it's still slanted, but just less drastically. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's kind of just to get the runoff from the roof over to, they actually have some plantings on the outside of their structure, so kind of just moving that rainwater from the roof over to the plants that are planted there. Any thoughts of what they're planting in there first? Whew. Um, definitely a fruit tree. Um, I'm not, I couldn't figs, say. Figs, I think. Yeah, figs. They were probably figs. getting a lot of figs. Figs, um, mulberries. Um, Jujubes, different vines, stuff that's harder to grow in a normal greenhouse. Yeah, yeah. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else? Question? Will you take the show on the road and build one in my house? <laughs> <laughs> Did you need to get any permits for construction then? in an urban area? Um, we did We looked into it, and thankfully we did not. I mean, it's a pretty small structure, and it's not like a living space. And uh, the real zoning thing was kind of the property line. Yeah, just you knowing can't the, build too close to a property line. Yeah, just knowing what the property line was and how far and how far to be away from it was probably the most important part zoning-wise. And one of the benefits of not affixing to the house meant it's a shed, uh, basically a yeah. shed-like structure. <laughs> it's not a shed, obviously. Yeah. yeah. That, Really, it's really a life issue. <laughs> yeah. You're done. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.